<clears throat> You're live now, Chairman. Good morning and welcome to this special virtual meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. My name is Councillor O'Donnell and I'm the Chairman for this meeting. You will have been provided with the Council's etiquette for virtual meetings in advance of this meeting. However, to reiterate the main points, please ensure your device is fully charged or is charging. Please mute microphones when not speaking. Please indicate in the chat bar if you wish to speak. When invited to address the committee, please ensure your microphone is switched on and switch off immediately once you have finished. Please ensure you have switched off or to silent any other devices you have that may interrupt the proceedings. If any members encounters IT problems causing them to drop out of the virtual meeting, they should use best endeavours to rejoin as quickly as possible. Should the member be unable to rejoin the meeting, they will be deemed to have left the meeting at that point and the meeting will continue provided it remains quiet. The number to call should you experience any IT problems is the IT help desk and the number will be put in the chat function. Please note that the meeting is being broadcast live and that members of the public are able to view the proceedings. I can confirm that checks have been made to ensure that all members of the committee are in attendance and have confirmed that they can see and hear the proceedings. Also present online with me are the following officers, Scrutiny Support Officer Justin Long, Democratic Services Officer Liz Javorska and Head of Regulatory Services Robert Weeks. So moving on to item one on the agenda, Liz, do we have any apologies? None received, Chairman, although I believe Councillor Crump will be joining us shortly. Thank you. I now invite members and officers to make any declarations of interest to the meeting. So given the subject matter we're discussing, I'm going to declare that I'm a candidate in the upcoming county council elections. Can anybody else have any other links with the county council that may wish to we do. We none of us have declared yet whether we're standing as candidates um, because the, we're not. Uh, we've not signed yet, so we. we ah. Can't. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Junot, for bringing that to my attention. So moving then on to item three, Chairman's brief. As members will see, there is only one item on the agenda today. Um, so, Councillor Mills, did you have your hand raised? <clears throat> You're on mute, Councillor Mills. So sorry, Madam Chairman. Yes, I'm, I'll be standing as a, a county council candidate in the next uh, May elections, Madam Chairman. I thought I'd declare that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Mills. Um, so moving on to item three, Chairman. Um, the only point I wanted to make before we get into the agenda is to alert members to the report on call-in arrangements that is going to council next week. The report presents options to revert the pre covid for call-ins and to consider making permanent the restriction of call-in to key decisions. I would urge members to study the report and consider its implications for our work. We should, as an organisation, be working towards pre-decision scrutiny and I would hope to keep call-in to a minimum and would ask that key decisions criteria is regularly reviewed. So moving on to item number four, working together with Warwick District Council. As members will recall, we were unhappy that this report came to us too late to consider at our last meeting. We have therefore arranged this special meeting to consider the Cabinet report on the principle of further integration, including a potential full merger with Warwick District Council. Thoughts from our committee can then be fed into the Council meeting next week. With us today, we have the Leader of the Council, Councillor Tony Jefferson, and Chief Executive David Buckland, and we welcome them both. I want to get through as many questions as possible. However, to begin, I wanted to invite both Mr Buckland and Councillor Jefferson to make any introductory remarks and please continue to put your um, questions in the chat. So Mr Buckland or Councillor Jefferson, who would like to open? I, I, I was polite. I was going to wait for Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Oh, sorry, can I also mention that um, Tony Parks is here as well? Fine. <clears throat> if I just pick up then some of the background to why we are considering the principle of merging with Warwick. Uh, it became quite obvious about 18 months ago that uh, local government was under tremendous financial pressure. As it happens, the Warwick District Council and ourselves had a number of senior management vacancies. 
the more Andrew Day and I talked, the more it seemed a good idea to explore the potential for working much closer together. Uh, what you've also got to remember is that in the background while this was going on, there was muted a white paper on local government reorganisation. Uh, that would have pushed uh, an awful lot of changes into the local government scene. It would probably have meant the creation of uh, a great number of unitary councils. In parallel, as we were talking about this, uh, Warwickshire County Council um, began to put together a proposal for a single Warwickshire unitary. Uh, that caused us to accelerate our thinking and accelerate our discussing and uh, doing background work on the merger. And I think what comes out of all this is one very clear point. The district councils, the districts and borough councils in Warwickshire are going to disappear. Warwickshire County Council have already made a submission to the department uh, for a single Warwickshire unitary. That is now on the table, it's with the department. So that if at the end of the day, we do not merge with Warwick, and if the other three boroughs do not get together, there will almost certainly be a single Warwickshire Unitary Council. That means there is an inevitability in my view that all the districts and boroughs in Warwickshire will disappear. Now, if you look at the financial implications of the proposed merger, they are in the budget already and the savings there are essential to ensuring we have a sustainable budget over the period of the medium term financial strategy. And I'm sure Mr Buckland uh, can elaborate on that if needed. So at the moment we are at the early stages and we have done a lot of work which demonstrates that actually on a many, many factors, a merger between Warwick and Stratford is a good thing. And you all heard the presentation last night from Deloitte. There are a great many advantages in us getting together. And I think at the back of members' minds, they need to keep one thing very, very clear. Stratford District Council is going to disappear. And the choice facing us is between, in essence, being one of two, in other words, getting together with Warwick, or being one of six if we end up with a single Warwickshire unitary. So that's the big picture background. Life is not going to stay the same. There is an absolutely no point pretending it is. It really isn't. Now, I know there are an awful lot of issues in detail, and I know that one of the main issues raised last night was about council tax. And I think David Buckland has a presentation that may well help explain some of the issues there. So um, over to you, Madam Chair. Can I come in as, as, as well, please, Chair, just to give a, a little bit of context about what is being asked of council next week and what isn't being asked. So as you know, back in July last year, there was this uh, statement issued by the two leaders of Biden Stratford District Council to commit to work more closely together. And that was followed then by the report to Cabinet and Council, which started the integration of your management team. So your management teams have very much started the integration now. And we have, as from the 1st of March, we'll have five joint heads of service between two local authorities. And that, that also instigated the start of the uh, joint work in relation to the, the local plan. What has been commissioned from Deloitte is an independent piece of work from Deloitte looking at the merits and disadvantages of, of potentially coming together as a merged two authorities. And that does stand as an independent piece of evidence that was considered last night. And, and I do thank James again for such a thorough briefing of the, um, of the piece of work. 
I, I do want to be clear that what, what Council are being asked to do on the 22nd is to endorse the vision of working together to become effectively one authority by 2024. But there will be further reports and further work undertaken to support that work, and that will then come back for a further council decision before any submission is made to central government. So before we as an authority made any approaches to government to say that this is what we want to do formally, there would be an opportunity for a huge amount of additional work, a huge amount of consultation, looking at the implementation programme which was being suggested within the recommendations before any final decision by council. So I just want to make it clear that on Monday, you're not being asked for a final. This is going to be a submission to central government being prompted by that decision. It's, it's just a direction of travel, if you like, at, the, at this stage before any further decisions of council. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy, as Tony says, that the main issue that I thought was coming out of the presentation last night was around council tax harmonisation. <clears throat> and chair, with your concern, at some point, I'd like to just run through a brief presentation that I put together to hopefully try and explain that issue in a bit more depth. Thank you, um, David. That's that's really helpful. I think if I can also just welcome to the meeting George Hill, who is our head of resources and transformation and also Tony Parks is our deputy chief executive. Welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to join us on this extra meeting. David, would you like to run through your presentation now around council tax? Because there are some questions around that um, and then we can go into questions overall if that's all right. OK, I will. I'll endeavour to do so, Chair. I've never shared my screen during a live event, so I hope this is going to work. And Justin, will it, I hope nod your head if you think it's going to work. If I, if I hope it's not on this head, let's 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 see what happens. Um, right. Can everybody see my screen? Can I just check that. Yes. OK, so as I say, last night at the presentation that James provided, it, it seemed that the main line of questioning related to council tax harmonisation. And, and this is the basis that when formed, any council area has to have the same level of council tax levied across the whole of that council tax, uh, that, that council area. And, and this is what we've seen in some of the community governance reviews that we've already had within the Stratford district, places like Bodicer and Henley, Arrow with Weasley. When parishes come together, then the expectation there is that there's a consistent level of council tax across that area. That would be exactly the same with two local authority districts joining together that that new count that new area would have to have a common level of council tax now currently the report and quite rightly identified this as an issue and it also identified that there are differences in the proposed level of council tax the, the figures that are contained within the report relate to the current 2021 council tax figures but of course as we all near full councils next week We've now got the proposed level of council tax for 21-22. So for the purposes of this presentation, I've incorporated them into this report. Stratford, as you'll be aware, is proposing a five pounds increase in council tax. That would take our band D figure to 149 pounds 12. And Warwick are also considering a five pound increase that would take their council tax figure to 176 pounds 86. The difference between the two is 27 pounds 74. Now, before, before I go on, it would be for the future council, if that was formed, to make a decision as to what approach they took to council tax harmonisation. So we are talking about something well into the future, but it is an issue that at least needed to be identified as a potential issue in, in relation to merging. Now, the report itself identifies three potential ways forward in relation to council tax harmonisation. Um, the first one, and I've illustrated this just, just for members' benefits so they can see how that would work, would be that Stratford-on-Avon continues to increase its council tax by £5 a year and Warwick District Council freezes their council tax. Under that approach, we don't get harmonised, we don't get to a common figure until the year 27-28. So you'll see there, Stratford's figure goes from 149 to 154 in £5 increments, which is the current maximum permissible for district councils and Warwick District Council freezes their level of council tax. The issue for that for Warwick District Council up until the point of merger would be that they would be losing council tax income that they could otherwise have levied and therefore that does start to detract some of the savings which would be achieved by, by the merger. The second option is for a much quicker harmonisation. 
so in, under this model again, Stratford District Council increases their council tax by five pounds a year. And then on the fourth year, which is the, the assumed year of inception of the new authority, you would then harmonise at the higher level. Warwick District Council freezing at £176.86 for the duration up until that merger again. And then the third option, just for, for, for clarity, was that we both continue with £5 a year increases or the maximum permissible increases in council tax. And that at the point of merger, then a weighted average of the council taxes is taken, which doesn't therefore cost any more across the piece, um, but you do then get that standard level of council tax issued. So that, that, that would show Stratford figure would move from £149.12 now to potentially £178 or there thereabouts by 24.25. So they're the three options for, for identified within the report. There will be further options that could be considered for this, but 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 for the purposes of the, the report, they were the three that were considered. Reference was also made last night to the wider local government review and one of the issues that was raised in the County Council report in relation to harmonisation, but not explored in any depth whatsoever, was the issue about the different levels of council tax across the wider Warwickshire area. So the difference between Stratford and Warwick's uh, council tax, you'll see from this slide, if the proposed increases go through next week, is that still that £27 figure? But the big difference is the difference between Stratford District, £149, and Nuneaton and Bedworth, which is nearly at £245. So that would be an issue that should wider local government review come about for a unitary warrantship would need to be considered about the council, the impact on Stratford and Avon District Council taxpayers at that point, because we would then be nearly £100 beneath the, the, the highest level at, at, at Nuneaton and Bedworth. And even if you looked at the, a harmonised average across a piece, it would be much higher than the figure for, for Warwick at the moment at £276. So that, that was just to try and explain the council tax harmonisation figure. I, I do have one, one further, a couple of further slides, if that's OK, Penny Ann, just, 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 sorry, Chairman. Um, the first one, and I, 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 I must remind uh, the OSC, this is the proposed medium term financial plan as per the, the Cabinet uh, decision on the 18th of uh, January and is being reported to the Council for decision next week and that shows that our reserves over the next five years even with the savings assumed from working with Warwick District Council go from around seven and a half million pounds at the end of 2021-22 to around 2.7 million mm -hmm. which is just above the, the minimum that our section 151 officer George Hill says we should maintain as a, as a local authority. Uh, for illustrative purposes without the, po the proposals which have been included within the budget from working with Warwick District Council more closely. Those reserves, we, we are not assuming any savings whatsoever in 21-22, but by the time we get to the end of the MTFP period in 25-26, there's one and a quarter million pounds worth of recurring savings included in that year. Without those savings, we would be in a deficit position with the reserves of, of around 420,000. That That is in no way a political point. I just wanted to make the, the, the point for um, illustrative purposes that there is a lot of additional savings included in the budget based on the working with Warwick and without those proposals they would have to be identified from other sources. That's, that's just a state of fact Chairman. So I'm happy to take any questions on particularly the council tax issue first if, if that's something that your committee wants to explore. Thank you so much um, David that's really helpful and you'll be, you won't be surprised at all there is a flurry of questions around council tax. So I'm going to start initially with Councillor Fitter then we have a question from Councillor Crump then Councillor Junard and then Councillor Fragley. Cool, thank you Chair. Uh, good morning David. So um, I, I understand that um, with this merger the public pound will benefit, um, services will be a lot more efficient etc but thinking about the pockets of residents uh, in Stratford-upon-Avon is it fair that residents are now going to have to be paying more for their services um, to merge with Warwick District Council? And with the Deloitte report, would we not consider a fourth option um, where harmonisation goes the other way? Just being uh, optimistic, is that not something that we could consider where Warwick levels are ambitious towards coming down to Stratford's levels? OK, if, if I can respond to that point, Chair. The, 
and, 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 and we've got George Hill on the on the call as well, who, who can come in with some further detail if necessary. Of course, the option could be to harmonise at the lower level that the Stratford on Avon District Council with current level of council tax. And, and as I said earlier, that will be a decision for any future council to make. The disbenefit of harmonising at the lower level is that all of the savings, the £4.6 million pounds worth of recurring savings, which Deloitte have identified in the report, could be possible by joining together, would be lost by that lower council tax yield that would be generated across the, the wider South Berkshire. Because if you harmonise at the lowest level, you're not effectively recovering the, the council tax, which is currently being levied within the Warwick District Council area at that higher rate. So that would go significantly against the, the, the level of savings. I think Tony mentioned it within the, the introduction. It's inevitable that we will be receiving less government support as we move forward. We, we, we've already been on notice that um, there is a spending review coming and that spending review has now been delayed three times. It's been delayed twice because of Brexit and once because of Covid. We are expecting though in 2021 to have a, a really good indication about our funding levels for the next four years and we genuinely expect them to be a poor settlement for local government. As I put within the, um, the, the, the forecast reserve statement, we will be in a deficit budget position of several million pounds a year, about 2.8 million pounds in 23-24, unless we do something to address those costs. And yeah, it's inevitable that if, if we didn't do this, the impact mm -hmm. upon public services would be significantly higher if we worked in isolation to try and deliver that level of savings without trying to deliver them in partnership with another, lo another local authority area. I think Tony Jake, uh, the, sorry, the, the League would like to come in as well on that point. Um, I'm just wondering if we should put forward, I mean, I've got four questions on council tax, if we should put all of those out there, Councillor Jefferson, then you can deal with it all. Is that okay, just to save you time? Um, yeah. Because it, is that, I think that might give you more of a view of what the committee's concerns are. So That's does that answer fine, your question? Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Jefferson. Does that answer your question, Councillor Fitter? So uh, um, I guess the answer is that um, it doesn't benefit the pockets of residents of Shuttle and Avon then. I'm, I, I don't think I said that oh. council. I, th I think we, 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 the proposal seeks to preserve as many council functions mm -hmm. as possible. And if we weren't working with the Bright District Council, then the assumption already within the medium term financial plan was to increase council tax by the maximum permissible amount. And, and that, that is what's being proposed um, at least for the next couple of years. Ultimately, though, and I think I've made the point twice now, this isn't a decision for this council to make. If, if we merged, it would be the first decision for the new council to make. It wouldn't. And, and that would be what they would need to do at that particular time in order to balance their, their budget at that point. Thank you very much, um, Mr Buckland. That's, does that help you out, Councillor Fitter? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to move on to a question from Councillor Crump. He's messaged that some of my residents have asked a question about the super district. Would there be a referendum similar to the one that Warwick District Council proposed about a five pounds per month green climate charge? The residents have advised Councillor Crump that the merger wasn't mentioned in the 2019 manifestos, so councillors don't have a mandate for this. Um, so will there be a referendum on any council tax increases? So, sorry, Penny, are you, are you going to ask several questions and then let's just... Yeah, OK, yeah. then. That's fine. Then I was just pausing so that the okay. question could land. Then we're going to move on to Councillor Junard, then Councillor Fragley, and then Councillor Wally Hoggins. Councillor Junard. Yes, I, I wanted to highlight a slightly wider issue. I mean, for example, when you do look at the comparison in the council tax, uh, it has highlighted the reduction in services in the district, Stratford district uh, compared to Warwick district over, over some years. But my, my question is actually more about the differences in parishes and parish precepts. Um, the Dit Stratford uh, had a policy for many years to keep the council tax down by pushing some services to the parishes and the parish precepts as a result uh, rose. Now Stratford has about 115 parishes, Warwick District Council has 20. Stratford has a range of parish precepts between uh, £152.32 at Farnborough to nil in some cases. And most of that is because green spaces and play areas, for example, are mostly maintained by the parishes, except in Stratford Town, where they are maintained by the district. So, for example, we end up with Al Ulster having a parish precept of £134 and Stratford having a parish precept of £39, £40, mainly because of the difference in the maintenance of 
of uh, green spaces, play areas. Warwick District Council has a a maximum range of its parish precepts between about £30 uh, over all its parish precepts because Warwick keeps keeps control of all the play areas. So this is going to be something that is has not been discussed so far, but there is going to be, uh, I mean, some of the parish precepts are larger than the district council precept, and, and that is going to have quite a dif make a difference on residents' um, pockets. Um, so I, I really do think that that needs to be um, discussed and clarified exactly um, what what the services are and why some of that there is such a wide range. Uh, because if you had to add some of the maximum on 152 onto the Stratford District Council uh, precept, you're putting that £27.74 into stark uh, relief. Very big difference. Thank you, Councillor Junard. Can I ask people please to keep their questions succinct? Um, and can we now move on to Councillor uh, Fragley, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my council tax bill is compiled from, uh, from more than one council, obviously, because I have to pay um, district, county and uh, town and the police commissioner. Um, I, I, I don't expect this decision to be made solely on uh, council tax. Uh, and I suppose my, I'm making an observation really in that if I did look at it from council tax, I'd want to know what I was going to get, not me personally, but you know, the, the, community, the community were going to get. And if I've got one council tax from the South Warwickshire Council and um, plus the county council um, at one level, or if the county, if the county council decided to go unitary, would I then find I'm paying more to the county council as a unitary, uh, as opposed to what I would be paying to the, the, the South Warwickshire uh, council and the county council? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fraser. That's a very interesting question. Um, and then finally, coming on to Councillor Wally Hoggins. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, how will this merger then, if we're going to have, if our residents are going to have to endure um, an increase in you council tax? Crump. How She's will? Sorry, Liz, I think you're not on mute. Sorry, I beg your pardon. How will this merger then and the increase in council tax that our residents will have to endure benefit our residents? What noticeable difference will our residents see? Thank you, Councillor Ollie Hoggins. So, um, Councillor Jessen and um, Mr Buckland, if there's any response to the council tax element of the questions, please. Uh, <clears throat> if I could respond first, Chair, and then I'm sure David will come in. In response, uh, going in reverse order, in response to Councillor Wally Hoggins' question, uh, given what's already in the budget for cost savings from the merger, if the merger does not go ahead, then it is inevitable that residents will see services cut. Uh, that is absolutely clear from the financial position of the council. Uh, picking up uh, Councillor Fragley's question. Um, Sorry, Councillor Jefferson, can I just come in there just very quickly? I think that the um, driving point of Councillor Hoggins' question was what benefits will they see? Are you saying the benefits will be that services won't be cut? Correct. OK, thank you. Fine. Picking up uh, Councillor Fragley's question, uh, given the uh, information that uh, Mr Buckland put up on his slides, I would say that the probability is that if there were a single county unitary, the council tax for Stratford residents would be higher than under a merged Warwick and Stratford scenario. But again, that will probably need working through, and it is rather unfortunate that those um, working through were not in the Warwickshire County Council's submission. Uh, picking up some of the other points when it comes to the parishes and precepts and what the parishes do, I think that will be a decision for the new council. Because obviously, if you're merging two organisations together, and they operate differently, then there will need to be some harmonisation. And the reality actually is 
the new council will have to decide on the level of harmonisation and how to move from where we are now to where we where the new council decides it wants to be. Um, I think I've covered most of the issues. Um, David. Jim, with your concern, if I, if I come back on some of the points. The, the, the first point that was raised by Councillor Crump in relation to the referendum, the, the proposals, the report that was prepared by um, Deloitte absolutely talks about public consultation and it talks about also consultation with stakeholders and, and, and that would be uh, businesses and other sectors of public sector across the, 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 the wider Warwickshire. It doesn't propose a referendum in relation to this issue. Um, in relation to the Town and Parish Councils, yes, Stratford has got a wide variation of parish, um, I think there are 113 at last count, of which not all of them actually uh, preset, because some of them only have whole parish meetings. There is a difference between the responsibilities at Stratford and that with Warwick. Well, the one difference that we have identified is that the, the Stratford district parishes are generally the burial authority, whereas that the case in, in Warwick is that it is the, the district council. So that is an issue that would need to be considered thoroughly as part of any coming together. Um, as far as what Stratford pays, yes, Stratford, Stratford District Council does pay spend money on public open spaces in Stratford District, uh, Stratford Town. Of course, the, we've, we've had the debate in the past around the car parking receipts, mm -hmm. which are generated within Stratford, that go a long way towards meeting those costs. I think also Warwick District Council does have some of their own parks within their district that they maintain and don't that mm -hmm. the local town and camp parish precepts don't precept for those either. I, I think there are some similarities between the two there. If, if we had a unitary council, in response to council, Councillor Fragley's question, there would be a harmonised level of tax from that new Warwickshire authority. It would be the same level of tax across the piece. You wouldn't then get a separate district council element alongside the, the Warwickshire County element. So, but as I refer back to the slide earlier, the, the, the range in district council council tax band D figures is quite significant across the piece. Stratford's is proposed at £149, Warwick, uh, Nuneaton's is at 240 If you did a simple average of the two, that would be somewhere about £190 across the piece, would be the district element that would be added to the county council element. Now, we don't know, of course, that would be a, a decision for any future Warwick unitary authority or unitary authority to make. So I can't, we can't be sure how they would address that unit, that, that harmonisation issue, but it would it would exist for them, but a bigger issue than it does exist between Stratford and Warwick. I think Tony's mentioned, the, the, responding to the points from Councillor Wally Hoggins in relation to the benefits, and, and I hope the slide demonstrated what the benefits are from the proposed work with Warwick to our medium term financial plan. Without those level of savings, there would have to be further reductions in service proposed that would impact upon Stratford and Labour District Council residents. It, it does seem, and I think James made the point last night, that the public do not seem too adverse to savings in back office services, back uh, the actual administration of the local authority, but what they would be adverse to is reductions of valued services, do I say things like leisure, uh, public conveniences, those kind of things which have remained untouched as part of the budget proposals going forward on the 22nd of February. Thank you very much, Mr Butland. Um, I'm afraid you froze just when you responded to Councillor oh. Crump's question about the referendum on my feed. I'm sure okay. everyone else is fine, but what was the response about a, ref a public referendum around the increase in council tax? So, so there isn't a proposed referendum included within the the, 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 the client's report. What was being spoken about was full public consultation. We are blessed that we have Simon Perfield, our consultation manager, that's undertaken several consultations on behalf of the local authority and we would expect that to be the, the kind of way that we would engage with, with the public through public consultation. Just out of interest with that, with the experience they've had in public consultation, what has been the percentage of uptake from the residents in consultation? Enough to make it statistically significant. I can't give you the exact figures, but Simon is a member of the uh, National Research Association and, and he would ensure that any evidence coming forward would comply with that to make sure that you can place reliance upon the results. Thank you. So just, just for somebody who's not a statistician such as myself, as you all know, would that be above 50% of our residents, do you think, no. or is it less than that? It, it would be significantly lower than 50%, but it, I, I, could, I could ask Simon for 
what would be the pool, if that would be helpful, to make sure that the results are representative of the, of the wider geography of the district, if you, if, to get a sample size. Yeah, I think that'd be really helpful. And just so if it's not done by referendum, how is it being done? Public consultation? Because okay. referendum is the most public view for consultation. Council, I mean, we haven't determined that as yet. So I think I think it would be the, the absolutely the Lloyd's report and the covering reports talks about public consultation. It will be done to a format that our council and Warwick would be happy with. So there's time to inform that. So we haven't made those decisions as yet. It's the, the exact form, the exact size, how we would do it. But but there is a commitment there to have full consultation undertaken. That, that's good to know because obviously um, the Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government says that locally led changes to the structure of local government, whether in the form of unitarization or district mergers, can with local support be an appropriate means of ensuring more suitable local government and local service delivery. So obviously that public consultation is, is a vital thing to start flagging up to people early on in the process. Um, so that's a relief to hear that it's built in. Um, I think we have a follow up from Councillor Wally Hoggins. Yes, to go back to the council tax and so forth, can you, uh, and we hear this mentioned a lot, um, could you please tell me specifically which services would be cut if these council tax rises didn't go ahead or this merger? Specifically, I want to know, please, and our residents will want to know which services will be cut. Thank you. I think, in all honesty, Councillor Wally Hoggins, uh, we can't give you details on that, but if you were to look at the medium term financial plan, you will see from 22, 23 onwards, there are savings identified that would take out things like UBUS. Uh, the reality actually is we would have to follow that up and take out even more services to balance the budget. I am pretty sure we could put something together, but in all honesty, that would be quite an artificial uh, measure. Suffice to say, we would need to save about one and a quarter million pounds additional a year. Given we only spend about 15 million, I am pretty sure you can work out that would mean some fairly substantial cuts in services. So you, but that's not your question, Councillor Not really. No, it doesn't. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think that covers everything for council. Did, Mr. Buckland, did you have anything else you wish to add to that? No. I, I, look, we, we, because the savings from Warwick have been built into the budget, we haven't had to consider any further reductions in in service. But when the work of the Council Recovery Advisory Group was being considering that the, the budget proposal is coming forward, it would be the discretionary functions that the council undertakes that would be I'm sure considered first by any yes. kind of future reductions in expenditure. Now we can't predict what, what council because that would have to be a decision for a future council to make if we were to deliver that level of savings but the discretionary functions are those that include things like leisure, uh, public conveniences, street cleaning, Th those are the kind of discretionary functions that we undertake as a local authority. So. If, if we were we're here to do a duty, we're here to pick the bins up, we're here to provide environmental health planning services, those kind of functions, they would be more protected than the discretionary functions, which dare I say, CCTV is a function that we provide that our public really support, but it is a discretionary function. And um, this isn't trial waving. You, you've asked a question about what would have to be considered. We, we don't know, but that all of those kind of discretionary functions would have to be considered. So what I'm picking up actually is that residents will need to know what type of services might be at risk when they're considering whether this is, because it's just about messaging, isn't it, to our residents? And obviously we know you've got a very thorough report from Deloitte and you've had a lot of consultation between yourselves about this. But when this is actually a format that will have to be sold to residents, if you want them to engage with a consultation, then um, I would suggest, because you, you will know what a discretionary service is, but a lot of people would yeah. need that clarified and I think that might be the point that Councillor Wally Hawkins was driving at with coming back asking specifically which ones. I think if we had a general idea, so as you've just done there, Mr Buckland, about well, street cleaning, leisure, that will, that will advise also highlighting what the District Council does. There's still a misconception about what we do compared with what Warwickshire County Council do and it's nationwide. You see the, the um, infograms, don't you, on social media explaining what different councils do. I'll come to you in just a moment, Councillor Mills. Is it regarding um, council tax, Councillor Mills? 
Probably not, Ag, but uh, okay. it, it's about social services, so that on, on another heading. Yeah, that's. I think we're coming on to that one later, aren't we? Um, okay. Can I just can I just quickly go back to the idea about public consultation? I think this will also pull in. I think it was Councillor Fragley had a question about the timeline. Um, so why? I understand with regards to the whole local government picture around reduction in funding from central government. Um, but why is the cabinet making these proposals and agreeing this expenditure of £300,000 over three years without first establishing that there's public support for this particular plan? And what's our plan B? What other options have been considered? You know, not merging or merging with another authority. And if they have been considered, where is the analysis of these options? I'm not seeing a lot of option analysis detail brought forward. So can you just give us the background on what's been happening that's led you to thinking this is the best deal for our wonderful district and our residents? Uh, I think if I could pick that up, Chair, I think it's when you look at the fit between uh, Stratford District and Warwick District, the fit and the synergies are really considerable. Uh, we haven't considered any other options in detail because, uh, and if you look at the Deloitte report, it actually did reinforce just how close the fit is. Um, and I think the reality actually is as well, um, councils are meant to provide community leadership. And in reality, as the world changes, I think what we are doing at the moment is providing that community leadership. I mean, the difference between 2019 and now is really quite stark. And we have responded to a massive change in circumstances. I think that's what residents elect us to do. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Um, so just quickly picking up, and I completely agree with you that we are um, a nimble and flexible organisation in responding to our place within the community, absolutely. So just given the amount of work, and you've put a considerable amount of work into this, and I, I'm not sure 100% of what the costings thus far have been with Deloitte's, um, what is the response from, from Whitehall about this? What is Robert Jenrick and Paul Rousel saying in response to these to this application, are you getting positive feedback they may be responsive or is it that actually they're concentrating on COVID, encouraging the rest of the country and local government to do that for now and this is something that could be postponed? I mean, what, what's your view about the response you're going to get from the powers that be that then decide if this can even be considered with all the work you've put in thus far? Uh, my picture of the response from uh, uh, the department is that the paper on local government reform will be issued after the county council elections in May. So the reality actually is there may be a pause, but it will not be a long, a long pause. We have kept the department in the loop in terms of everything we are doing. We've had no negative feedback as yet. Uh, they are willing to um, consider submissions. And one of the issues is, and it's one of the issues why we are doing the work now, is that often when they ask for submissions, the time scales they put on the submissions are so tight that if we have not done preparatory work, we would not be able to meet the deadlines. No, absolutely. You can be pushed into corner with timelines. So you say that, um, that Whitehall is positive. What specific positive feedback have you had? What specific dialogue and conversations have been had? Um, you know, what is the positive feedback and any actual sign of specific government support for our proposal? Not about the general district mergers, but specifically SDC, WDC, because we are focusing on that today rather than the national picture. Uh, specifically, we have had letters from the department. Uh, both Andrew Day and I have written to the department. We've had very specific responses on our proposals. Uh, I would have to go back and read the letters, uh, but I'd be quite happy to share the correspondence with you, Chair. That would be so helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and just as a general idea, what did the letter say? Just to reassure people that we are on the right lines, because I'm just aware that you've put so much work into this, uh, whilst also dealing with the pandemic, Councillor Jefferson. The, the reality actually is that the department will be happy to receive a submission from us. 
Brilliant, that's good to know. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. So we know we're on the right tracks with Westminster yeah. on that one at Whitehall. Uh, Mr Buckland. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I just, just wanted to respond, and it was actually quoted within the, the, the Deloitte's report, uh, an extract from a memo that was sent to Conservative councillors by Robert Jenrick back in October, which was actively asking effectively local authorities to consider such mergers. So I think from that perspective, the, the current Secretary of State has indicated that there is support for such a, a, a line of activity. I haven't contacted Paul Russell directly about this potential merger. Some of it is chicken and egg. When, when do you approach? Do you approach when you've, I think I'll go back to what I said earlier, what is being asked for council at the moment is a consideration of this vision. Is this the, the kind of sense of direction? Yes. One might say that it's inappropriate to ask a question until you've tested the opinion of members. I, I just don't know when you ask that question formally to say, we're serious now about this and that we will be coming forward at some point with a, a formal proposal which will be subject again as i said earlier to, to further consideration by council so at this point it's just that that indication that 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 kind of direction of travel if you like that Stratford it would be considered um consider that, that that way forward thank you mr buckland and could you just uh, just clarify for me how much has it cost us thus far with the reports and the investigation okay so the report has been jointly commissioned, the, the, the Deloitte's report. It costs 45,000 between the two authorities, so our contribution to that is 22,500. Thank you so much. It's just, I think, when we're so financially strapped, um, people will wonder what research has been done before we paid out. But I understand you're saying it's a very difficult um, navigation of an unknown at the moment, almost. And I, I would respond to that, that yes, it is a lot of money, 22,500 is a lot of money, but this is a, a significant decision that the council is being asked to consider and you know it, it, it's one which is considering the abolition of Stratford District Council you, you, you don't get much bigger than that so from that perspective to have some independent research to help the local authority I think is entirely appropriate. And I think you're quite right as well Councillor Jefferson with the timelines you never know what they're going to ask you to do from Whitehall with regards to that. I don't know if this is a good time to bring in Councillor Fragley regarding his timetabling question. Um, I'm not quite sure how this fits in at this point in the conversation. Shall I come back to you, Councillor Fragley? If you may. Yes. That's OK. Right. Let's move on to the next question. OK, I think we also had a question regarding the partnership between Warwickshire, Warwick District Council and Stratford District Council from both Councillor Wally Hoggins and Councillor Unit. Councillor Wally Hoggins. Thank you, Chair. Um, why does Warwick want to merge with SDC? Because we are clearly the poorer cousins here. What is it? What's in it for them? Thank you. Uh, I think if I can pick that up, uh, the reality is we both consider that we are far stronger together. Uh, the reality is that both our budgets are under pressure and if we actually look to the future we think that combining we are much stronger, we can provide better services and not only that and it's something that's often uh, overlooked, we have much more influence in terms of working with some of the really important bodies that are around like the Coventry and Warwickshire Local Enterprise Partnership and like the Combined Authority. Uh, the point that was made last night which is really significant in the West Midlands our combined uh, districts would have the second biggest GVA after Birmingham. It is very very significant so we we see we are much stronger together. We've had a number of joint meetings of cabinets and there is absolutely no doubt about it. We all at cabinet level understand the, the significance of getting together. Uh, Edward Fitter has asked what GVA. GVA is gross value added. Uh, in reality, it's a proxy measure for uh, economic output. Thank you very much, Councillor Jefferson. Um, can I just quickly come on to just pick up a point about the, the joint working and the synergy between Warwick and Stratford, if I may. So in the Deloitte's report there, um, they were proving that there's a single economic geography across South Warwickshire that relied on data 
on commuting that showed that, I thought it was really very interesting, 5,248 5, 5, residents commute from Warwick District area to Stratford and that 5,881 residents commute from Stratford District to Warwick District. Do we know where these figures come from? Chairman, can I respond to that? Yeah. That, that was the 2011 census, that we, we don't have any other travel to work information. Of course, 29th of March this year, we've got the 2021 census of Please take part in the census when that when the, the forms come through. But yeah, that, that's as up to date as the information we have. Indeed, yeah. And my question coming back to you is, are you happy that we're basing there are um, investigations on 10 year old data, even given the fact that we've got this census coming up and given the way that work patterns have transformed in the past 12 months, do we not need a better understanding of emerging economic geography before taking a decision like this? So I think it's coming back to the timeline again. I think, Chair, what you've got to remember is that at the moment we're dealing with principles and vision uh, and we are using the best data we've got available. And one would actually hope that despite what we've been through over the last almost a year now, that some form of normality would creep back into the system over the next couple of years. Uh, all I would say is that the data we are basing it on seems to me to be uh, really quite powerful. The 2011 census? Yeah. Best data we've got, unfortunately. OK, so I'd, I'd argue it's the best you've got, but I'd say it's 10 years out of date. Um, but thank, thank you, Councillor Jefferson. I just know we've got quite a few questions coming in thick and fast. I know that Councillor Rolf has a question and Councillor Junard, sorry, Councillor Junard um, before that. And I think Councillor Mills, your question is quite similar to Councillor Junard. So Councillor Mills, um, then Councillor Junard, then Councillor Rolf <coughs> and then Councillor Wally Hoggins. I'm on, yes, thank you. Thanks, Madam Chairman. Yes, um, yeah, my concerns with um, SDC and uh, uh, you know, as a union, sure, with, uh, sorry, SDC and Royal District Council are the uh, essential services. Um, we've got uh, education, social care and, and fire service as well. Um, as an authority, will we be able to cope with this? And, you know, because uh, that's under the umbrella of Warwick County Council at the moment. And of course, I, again, it looks like there'd be enormous cost involved. So uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Mills, we are talking about a merger between two districts to create a super district. The county council will still exist and will still provide those services. So, so, so we, we're not cherry picking then. No, so we, we use their services because we can't. You know, we're we're going uh, as a, no. a two. Uh, we're we're joining with Warwick District, but then. We're not providing the service. Well, OK, when we are creating a super district, Councillor Mills, a super district is merely two districts combining together. It does not replace the two tier system. OK. Thank you. Can, I, can I just quickly come in um, on that? What will happen with the legal services that you currently buy in from Warwick County Council? Will that continue with that format or is that something we're taking over as a super district? Uh, I think as a super district, uh, there will be a review of all the operations of the district. I think it is more than likely that uh, legal services will come in-house. And that's been um, allocated budget-wise as well? Yes. Thank you, Leader. Um, moving on to Councillor Junard. Yes, but uh, Warwick District Council does provide quite a number of additional services that Stratford District Council does not provide. Um, notable, for example, more, much more on uh, economic development, but also housing and they have a housing company. Yeah. Um, so and um, culture and arts, they have a have that provision. I would like to see if we are going to have an increase uh, in council tax, then we, we should benefit. There should be some harmonisation. Well, have you thought about that harmonisation? of services across the two parts for this super district? In principle, yes, Councillor Junard, in detail, no. We are still at very early stages. And if you listen to an awful lot of the questions that have been asked, uh, you'll appreciate there is an awful lot more work to do. At the moment, we are focusing on the principles and the vision to take us to the next stage. 
And the more we talk, the more we realise how much work will need to be done in bringing together two organisations and providing harmonised services and facilities for the residents of South Warwickshire. Um, I think what, what people are picking up on though, Leader, is the, the financial commitment thus far for this vision with the 300,000 committed um, future planning. I think that's possibly what keeps the, these detailed questions coming up. Um, OK, I think we also uh, had a question. Me, Chair, can yeah. I just pick up on that? Yeah, because if you look at that commitment compared to the savings that both councils will actually make, that actually makes their medium term financial strategies work, I think that sets the appropriate context. Thank you, Leader. <clears throat> Mr. Buckland, did you have a comment? Yeah, I, I, I think I think it would be worthy of, of members raising concerns about the 300,000 to review the lessons learned from the um, Taunton Dean and Somerset West merger, where it was identified that under resourced project management seriously impacted upon the delivery of the expected outcomes from, from the merger. Yeah. Um, that, that I think we made it available as a link to the cabinet report, but I would urge members to, to do that. And of course, it would be negligent if we didn't learn lessons from other local authorities that have been down the same path. So the level of uh, contribution is £300,000 from each local authority. You're right, £600,000 combined to deliver uh, recurring savings of 4.6 million. So that, that's a one off 600,000 against 4.6 million per year. Is, is the assumption and, and yeah I, I, I fully commend to council properly resourcing project management because if, if, if we're not managed in this process then things can go wrong we, we've had Chris Elliott and myself who's the chief executive at Warwick had a, an excellent conversation with Steve Baker who's the chief executive of East Suffolk Council they had something like 300 work streams that they managed through the merger of, of their two local authorities and absolutely brought in support to make that happen and, and, and derive the best benefits for communities and businesses out of that. So, yeah, I, I would personally defend the 300,000 as being a modest sum given the, the potential savings which uh, could be derived from this, benefit, this merger. Thank you, Mr. Buckland. You've actually answered my next question, which, which was going to be that the Somerset Western Taunton audit report on their merger stated that the expected benefits were actually outweighed by them going over budget. So that is the 300,000 from us is a buffer yes. to try and prevent that happening. OK, well, that clarifies that point for me. Thank you very much. And so by incorporating more budget for change management, you are ensuring that we don't come and fall into the same, same problem areas they did. Thank you. Um, OK, so I think we then go on to Councillor Wally Hoggins, then Councillor Curtis. Thank you. Um, I just want to go back, please, to uh, the point that um, Councillor Mills raised with you, um, Councillor Jefferson, that um, in your opening statement, there was some discussion about the fact of the, the overview and, um, if you like, the, the single unitary, the, the proposal from Warwickshire. So actually, there would be an expectation that moving down the line that we will have to take responsibility for these services. And that was alluded to. Otherwise, we are doing this or proposing this amalgamation and then we will still be sucked into a, a, a massive unitary. So I, I think I do think that um, I do think I need some further clarification on that. And it's all very well saying that, no, this is just the merger of two districts. No, we, we fully know that this district is being this, this merger of the two districts is, is being done to obviate the sucking into um, a single unitary and the single and the unitary authority would take responsibility for social care, education, etc. So there will be an expectation that this super south district will eventually have to take responsibility for these areas of which neither Warwick nor Stratford has any um, experience in 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 doing that. Um, so that was just a pull up about that that I would like a response to. But also the Deloitte report highlights. Sorry to interrupt, Councillor Wally Hawkins. What is your specific question regarding so, the services? So the question is, are we going to be then going through this and then potentially becoming a single Warwickshire unitary or will we be making a bid to take over the services uh, as and when um, <coughs> services are run by Warwickshire County Council? in the fullness of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wally Hawkins. I think you had another question after that and then it's Councillor Rolf and Councillor Curtis. I do have another question and the question is um, that um, 
what consideration have been given to the fact that in the Deloitte's report, it highlights that any marginal failure to realise the savings could result in, in, in negligible or no savings being actually realised and therefore making the uh, combining with Warwick almost null and void. So um, what consideration has been given to that part of the Deloitte's report, please? Can I pick that up, please, Chair? I of think course. Mr Buckland uh, covered that point in his answer to the previous question. The reason why we put £300,000 in the budget is to actually make sure there is proper project management and the work is done. And I have to say that when I was in the private sector, I went through three mergers. The absolute significance of making sure one's got adequate project management and adequate management of the process is absolutely key. I've no doubts about it that the way we are thinking about it at the moment, uh, we will not fall into the same trap a lot of other councils have. And if I just make the point that this uh, paper going to council on Monday is about joint districts. It is not about unitaries. Unitaries may be a decision further down the track, and that is a decision that will come back to Cabinet and Council. But at the moment, it's about a joint district. Uh, Mr Buckland. Yeah, Chairman, and also in response, uh, Councillor Wally Hoggins is absolutely right. This isn't without risk, and, and, and the paper is, is honest. It, it provides 15 specific risks which have been identified that we need to manage and mitigate if we're going to go forward with this vision. There's some proposed mitigation within the report from Deloitte as to how to overcome some of the concerns that you've, you've raised, but it would have to be a very well managed process. I, I do accept that. And, and, and reverting back again to the Somerset Western Taunton, there's some learning points there about how not to do things. There were some, some learning points that we could benefit from, but also in discussion with some as East Suffolk and West Suffolk, there's also some very positive learning points that could help deliver significant savings for the, 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 the authorities moving forward. And we, we have had the offer from East Suffolk, East Suffolk that their leader, uh, Councillor Steve Gallant, would talk to our council about some of their learning points if, if, if we wanted to benefit from that in the future. As we I think that's very there. valuable. Yeah, I think the idea that you're in consultation with people who've gone through a similar um, project would be incredibly valuable um, and also to be made public part of that to our residents just to explain what's ahead with these sort of visions. I think the signposting for this and the navigation for residents is key that they are kept up to date with what this actually involves. Um, now I've, Councillor Rolf has waited incredibly patiently. I do apologise for missing you out Councillor Rolf, you're next. Um, thank you Chair. It is unfortunate because the previous um, uh, speaker sort of almost asked the question that I was going to ask and I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, so um, this is to uh, uh, Tony Jefferson. Um, uh, I mean, part of the reason w uh, this is being proposed is to protect the two districts and to become uh, a super district. But there is absolutely no reason that a single unitary will suck us in and take us in as a single unitary. Uh, somebody will make that decision and, you know, what are the implications of that? Going through all this cost for a super district to find out that two years along the line we're sucked into a single unitary. And, and it could happen and possibly will happen. Thank you, Councillor Rolf. I think that actually that that is summarising the concerns that we, a lot of us have raised in our questioning. Yes. Yeah, so um, with Councillor Jefferson and then perhaps with Councillor Buckton. Um, I'm so sorry, Mr. Buckton. I keep I keep. Is it a demotion or a promotion? I'm not sure. I'm not I call you Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving that one open. Right, Councillor Jefferson. Can I just pick up on that point? Uh, there's a very clear message coming from the centre that uh, the proposals actually for any local government reorganisation have to have the support of local people and local authorities. And the reality actually is that at the moment, uh, all the districts and boroughs are united in not wanting a single Warwickshire unitary. 
Now, uh, that's one of the reasons why we are working on a joint district. And interestingly enough, uh, in parallel with this meeting, uh, I could have been at a meeting of all the district and borough leaders because we are continually talking about this. Uh, my sense at the moment is that a single Warwickshire unitary is by no means a foregone conclusion. Uh, we would not be doing this if we thought it was a foregone conclusion, but it certainly isn't. There is a long way to go on this. And um, my view, and I think the view of all, well, no, I know the view of all the leaders of the districts and boroughs is that a two unitary solution for Warwickshire would, from our perspective, be a lot better. So I do not accept that a single Warwickshire unitary is a foregone conclusion. Can I quickly come in and just ask a question in, in response to that, Councillor Jefferson? With your um, liaison with Whitehall, what what is do you know what their vision for Warwickshire is? As we're talking about the potential unitarisation, what is Whitehall's vision for Warwickshire? Are we aware of that as we're going through these various plans and jump through various hoops and having these costs? Do we know what their vision for, for Warwickshire actually is? Uh, the honest answer to that is no. And I think in all honesty, they are very much open to alternatives. Um, and certainly well, we've also involved the MPs in an awful lot of this debate and at the moment the consensus amongst the MPs is a two unitary solution would be preferred. Um, you've actually just picked up on a question I wanted to ask at the beginning. Where were the supportive statements from the MPs with regards to our papers around this subject? I mean, wh where have we got it actually in written confirmation that they are supportive of this idea? rather than the unitarisation, the single unitarisation? Uh, all I can say is this was mainly discussed at face-to-face, -face, well, actually, uh, virtual meetings. Yeah, face-to-face <laughs> -face is a long time ago now, Councillor. It is, yes. Sorry, <laughs> so you're, you're, you're telling away. me that, um, that both Nadim Zawari and um, Matt in Warwick and Leamington and um, Jeremy in Kelvin South, that they are all supportive of this? We have had discussions where the leaders of all the districts and boroughs and the MPs have been there and they understand and the picture I get from all the MPs and from all the leaders when they talk to their MPs is that there is support for a two unitary solution in preference to a single unitary. Thank you. OK, I can see Mr Buckner wants to come in. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. So, no, no, it's OK, Councillor Rolf, I'm coming back to you with a follow up. Okay, Don't worry, you. I can see you Thank gesticulating at me there, but I'm coming to Mr Buckland because I saw him sighing and that's his non-verbal that he's ready to add something. Okay. Mr Buckland. Yeah, well, I'll be very brief. So, and, and, and the leader said hello. I think, I think the position, a formal position from the MPs would be required before any formal submission is made at a later point for formal consideration about whether we want to become a unitary authority or not. This is a, at the moment two local authority areas, two sovereign areas, setting a vision that they would then go out and consult with the residents, public, other stakeholders, which would include MPs. So I think there will be plenty of time for that kind of um, discussion later on. I, I personally see this as two district councils who have got both financial problems. I think that the reference was made earlier about Warwick being in a, a much favourable financial position to us. They've got four and a half million pounds a year of savings that they need to deliver themselves. And this is a big part of their moving together. And we're taking the initiative to ensure that we, we remain financially sustainable into the longer term as district councils we're not we're not this isn't in response to council of mills and, and others this is purely at this stage just think of it as a parish community governance review two parishes come together that's what this is effectively two districts coming together if we're overtaken by events and that we become a wider Warwickshire unitary and another point i suppose the only issue is that you'll be then merging five local authorities not six and you'll have some learning points from what happened at Stratford around bringing together some of those district council functions that would have to be subsumed into a wider Warwickshire Council. So I don't, I don't, I see that there will be benefits in the short term to outweigh the cost of implementation and it could also lead to, lead to some learning points for the future should that be the decision of government ultimately in relation to Warwickshire local government. Thank you so much Mr Buckland. Um, Councillor Rolfe, I know you have a follow-up. Thank you. Um, I can assure you my vision is not a single unitary at all never was never will be um however if it came to 
But there are many, many, many people in Warwickshire that would like a single unitary. And it could, if it came to a referendum or to a vote, um, it could be that um, that we'd lose the option of the, the South and the North. I mean, I've always wanted um, a South and the North. Um, as, a, as a party, we put it forward to the County Council um, 11 years ago, we put the proposition um, and it was just pushed under the carpet. So I'm very much in favour of the North and South unitary and not a single unitary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rolf. I, I am pleased to have your support. Thank you, Councillor Rolf. Uh, lovely. Moving on then. I'm not sure I said I supported what you said, Tony. <laughs> I support a North South unitary. Everyone clear? OK, so um, <laughs> just 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 a quick going, going back a little bit. I just want to check with both Mr Buckland and um, Councillor Jefferson. Um, and we've talked about the MPs being in agreement. And I know we're just talking about a possibility of a merger here, but does it concern you that we seem to be a little bit out of the loop with what Whitehall and Westminster are thinking about a vision for Warwickshire? Is that of any concern to you both? Uh, frankly, at this point in time, Chair, no, because uh, in doing the work that we're doing and assuming the decisions go through both councils next week, then we will actually uh, resume communicating with the department. But I think it's essential to get through this stage and say, look, now it's real. Then I think that will be the time to start communicating in much more yeah. detail with the department. I mean, until unless if these go through, then we're in a position to really start a proper dialogue with them. And, and, and Chairman, if I may also, I, I think it would help Whitehall influence the debate in relation to the future structure of local government within Warwickshire. At the moment, the only authority that's made a formal submission to central government without any consultation of public, any stakeholders, is the County Council. They did so in a very hurriedly fashion uh, last year. And that's the only proposition that government have got on the table at present. And I think we, we can help inform the debate by, by making this decision and then starting the conversation about whether it's a proposition or not that government are, are willing to consider. So I think if, if we're serious about, you know, trying to set our own destiny rather than have it imposed upon us, then I personally think it is, it's at least having that converse, wider than other conversation. So you're, so you're saying it's on a different timeline basis. So the County Council submitted theirs, but they had a Lloyd's report as well, didn't they, or a similar? They had a Pricewaterhousecoopers report, yeah. Yeah, and they would have had the similar meetings that we're having. Yeah. But, but can I make the distinction, please, Councillor O'Donnell? Yeah. They've made a formal submission for consideration for local government review at Warwickshire County Council. They did so before any consultation. The mention has been made today of about a referendum. There is no consultation whatsoever with the public. They've done retrospective consultation with parishes. I'm aware of that. And, and, and I understand they're doing some public consultation now. But before they made their submission, they made no in, endeavours to consult in, and even indeed with, with the district council as well and within the strategic change document that they considered they listed the stakeholders and district and power councils were completely omitted from that document okay so you're reassuring us that before you make your submission to whitehall there will be public consultation can i be clear it's not my submission it would be council submission no, well, yes uh, absolutely yes. It, it would be following full so what, what's being considered next Monday is just, is this something the council is interested in? Is this, is this a direction of travel? We yeah. did a lot of work, including full consultation, before then any formal submission is made back to central government as to whether it's a view that council supports or not at that point. So uh, I, I believe that, that that's a proper way of doing it. I understand that it was time to know why a different approach was taken by the county earlier, this, well, last year. Thank and, you, Mr. And I just, I just, bring forth... just quickly for myself, um, with regards, I know we've talked about the 300,000 being changed and the buffer. Does that include costs for public consultation? It would include the con public consultation, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jefferson. Yes, can I just reinforce exactly what uh, Mr. Buckland has said? Um, we are taking time and we intend doing this 
very thoroughly before we're in a position to make a formal submission. The reality is, as I said, we've already indicated to the department that we will be preparing a submission. Uh, my view would be assuming that these papers go through both our cabinet, both our councils next week, then we would actually inform the Department of Progress and say we are well on the way and these are the next steps. So we are trying to do a very thorough job in terms of how we prepare and how we consult. And you are absolutely right, Chair, it is really important there is a uh, significant amount of public consultation to make sure there is support from the public uh, for this. But I come back to the point that in reality, you know, it's not a, well, if we don't do this, Stratford stays as it is, it won't. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Um, and thank you for clarifying the fact you're putting as forward as thorough a case as you can when yeah. you do submit. Thank you. Um, we've got some questions uh, from both Councillor Fisher and Councillor Junard regarding the joint working. Um, but before we go on to that, can I quickly check if when you go to this public consultation, I'm sorry to keep banging on about it, but I do believe it's very important. If when you go to this public consultation, if you don't get support, will you simply scrap this um, super district merger idea? What what it will be the plan B if this has to be scrapped because the public simply won't buy into it? I think uh, we will have to stand back and reconsider Councillor O'Donnell. Okay, so there isn't a plan B if it's... At the moment, no. Okay. The, plan, the plan B in reality is if the public won't buy into this, then what they've actually bought into by default is a single Warwickshire unitary. Okay, and I suppose with, with this submission, this will, um, if it goes to submission, this will open up the whole unitary discussion again anyway, won't it, with Whitehall? Yes. OK, thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Thank you. So we're going to go on to Councillors um, Fitter and then Councillor Junard and then Councillor Crump. Thank you, Chair. So just wearing my vice chair of the council hat for this question. Um, I, know, I know I understand if this hasn't been considered yet and probably isn't a priority, but civic mayors or chairmen are really important for community engagement between the community and the council. Has there been any discussions on on the future of this? Well, well Sorry, David, go on. Yeah, no, it's, it's a short, question, short response. Of course, until the new authority is formed, and, and at that point there would be a new council chairman for that wider geography. So, so yeah, the, the existing council chairman for Stratford and Warwick would be retained until the point of merger, should that be where we end up. And then, yes, there would be a, a chairman across the wider South Warwickshire at that point. <clears throat> Does that answer your question, Councillor Fitter, about yeah, your future thanks. post? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Moving on to Councillor Juno, please. Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about finance, but um, they, there is the issue of differing cultures. Uh, Warwick, Warwick District Council and Stratford District Council are very, very different uh, in, in the way um, they run. Uh, and th there is there is the potential for that to become a hurdle. So I, I would hope that the project management would look um, would look at the integration of the cultures. Um, could this be a problem? Is this something you already discussed up to this, st up this stage? <laughs> can I just say, can I add on to that? Sorry, can I add on to that? Also, the difference in age demographic between the two districts. Yeah, just picking up the cultures of the uh, two councils. Yes, we are very, very well aware of it, Councillor Junard. Uh, we've had a, a number of discussions about it. Uh, we understand it will be a major issue, as it is in all mergers. The one thing that is very clear, and it's something we are now very focused on, we are going to create a new organisation for a new council. So the reality actually is, it's what is the culture of that new organisation actually going to be? But we are very well aware of the issues of culture and having been through mergers myself believe me culture is the biggest single issue and the biggest single stumbling block but it can be overcome and it will have to be overcome if we're going to get together mind you if you think of the issues of merging two organizations imagine the issues in merging 
five, sorry, mm. six. And the age profile, yes, the age profiles are different, but I mean, there is then an advantage in actually uh, combining in that we get a much more balanced age profile in the new council. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Does that answer your question, Councillor Junard? Oh, sorry, Mr Buckland. Yeah, sorry, Chairman, if you, if you don't mind. The culture issue is picked up as one of the risks already within the deployment reports and certainly would be an issue that we would need to work on. I, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of reassurance that Chris Elliott and myself have already started engagement with the joint branches of Unison. And, and if I could just read a, a small extract from a statement that they've produced back to us. So this is from the staff side of the organisation. Um, and it says Stratford District Council branch and Warwick District Council Unison branches are committed to working with both employers in the move towards collaboration in the future. Both branches realise the challenges that are facing local government due to the national position and unitary authorities and recognise that we will need to work together to safeguard our services. So we, we have already had a very positive message coming forward from Unison. We have a suite of organisational change documents which are going to be considered by the um, Overview and Scrutiny Committee, uh, not Overview and Scrutiny, this is the Overview, the Employment and Appointments Committee, sorry, on the 16th of March, which will help with that further integration as we work more closely together. So. I just wanted to make that point that staff generally are, are supportive of, of, of the proposals coming forward here. Thank you, Mr Buckland. And can I just quickly go back to Councillor Juna's point about the cultures and the reassurance. Thank yeah. you, Councillor Jefferson, you've offered about how the merger could work positively. I, I'm still not clear, and I know it's so we can keep services going, what tangible improvements our residents will have in their everyday lives from this joint merger from this super district what's going to be the everyday life experience improvement that they will see from as a result of all this hard work you've been putting in okay i think but i mean i don't know if you want me to, to, to start later and then to come in. go on david because to, to be fair that they were the 10 benefits that, that james ran through last night in trying to bring the two authority at least selling some of the the non-financial benefits of bringing the two organisations together, this, this larger local voice. In, in the conversations we were having with the Chief Executive at East Suffolk, they were having far more say in relation to transportation initiatives in their locality than they ever had before when there were two relatively small districts. The LEP and the Combined Authority take that organisation far more seriously because it is a bigger economic voice than, than it was previously. So I think from the future infrastructure requirements, if nothing else, for, for the wider South Warwickshire, that would be a massive positive um, and I, I think it, it, a lot of it though does come back to together we are enabled, we're going to be able to provide far more than we can in isolation the kind of impact on staff will be lesser if, we, if we're together we, we, we're already talking the, the report talks about joint accommodation for uh, potentially new office headquarters would need to be one one office rather than two and a much more small office than, than, than we currently have so the, the benefits are identified within the report. I, I take the point about we would need to identify the so what. If this didn't happen, what would there before them be the implications upon the budgets at, at Stratford? And we, we have George, who's, who's on the call, who's listened very patiently. I don't know, Chair, Chair, if you wanted to just bring George in. Absolutely. Front of on that. Come on in, George. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I think I think that from a budget perspective, the key benefits are that we can retain the services that the council currently uh, provides. And I think it's been alluded to that the discretionary services that are the ones that are particularly under threat if we have to make service cuts are the ones that are particularly valued by residents and members, I think. And, and that is what we're protecting largely. And uh, that is a, a key benefit to both councils and the residents of both areas. I think if I may, much. I think if I may chair, there's one yes. other uh, advantage, uh, which probably people won't see for a number of years, but it could end up being very significant. And that's the fact that we will have a joint South Warwickshire plan. And that enables us to uh, be much more strategic and I think the point that David made about infrastructure, uh, there are many parts of the district that struggle with infrastructure at the minute. Joint South Warwickshire plan and the fact that we've got more influence and more clout 
means that we should be able to do more on the infrastructure side together than we could separately. Now, these benefits are really quite hard to sell because they're not going to appear for several years, but they will appear. That's reassuring. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. I think it's something that's definitely worth flagging up when we're trying to sell it um, to our residents as well. Uh, we have, I know that Councillor Crump has a question, then Councillor Fielding, um, and then I have a question, and then I'll come to Councillor Wally Hoggins. Councillor Crump. Thank you, Councillor O'Donnell. Um, apologies for the lateness. I um, had a consultant hospital appointment and not overrun, and I couldn't attend. Um, yesterday's briefing well I wasn't in the mood to attend yesterday's briefing it's my father-in-law's funeral yesterday so uh, I'm in a great week at the moment um so hopefully seeing your smiling face chair is has uh, helped to cheer me up a bit today so thank you for that um just a just a very really quickie um well two points first of all the consultation on again I, I believe you asked about that it'd be I'd be more interested to see what the consultation would involve um whether we would go down the referendum route which could be potentially significant cost or, or will be different form of re referendum uh, consultation. Because I know, um, having worked at Warwick District Council for 30 odd years, so I do know the difference between the culture and uh, between STC and WDC, um, quite from a unique position as well. Um, so um, it's, it's quite interesting. First of all, I know that there was last year um, mooted at WDC a referendum on a green tax of five pound a month if I'm right I might be slightly right but somewhere in that figure and it could be interesting but that would well, that would be carried on um, and I think that cost was the referendum was several hundred thousand pounds and again I might have be talking out of my hat so apologies David but councillor no Mr Buckland I'll get it right there in the end I nearly <laughs> insulted you there by calling you a councillor so sorry there David um so be, that would be interested and my other one um is my ears picked up about the HQ. Um, many years Warwick District Council was, was going to move and I was hoping to coincide my departure from WDC with uh, the office move and you know, it might have been financially advantageous for that to happen but unfortunately I couldn't wait that long and had to leave uh, at the end of 2019. So it's, it's things like that. How long will these projects take? You know uh, and I know the location of any potential HQ would be quite contentious, you know. Oh, oh, you know, it's too close to Stratford. It's too close to Warwick. It's, it's so it's there are quite a few points to consider, uh, and and we've got a lot to to manage. And I know that the the Gigabyte factory again. I might be talking at my hat using the wrong phrase, at um, at Coventry Airport again. That's a potentially a major project. Um, because I think that I think it actually falls in Warwick District. I might be again. I might be wrong, but yeah. Oh, well done, Tony. Good stuff. You're right. I've got one. I'm getting one or two things right. Yeah, you know, it's the scattergun approach. Shoot enough bullets, and you get one right now and then. Um, but Councillor Crum, can you just can you just clarify your because it's you're giving us incredibly informative um, informative viewpoints here. What are your specific questions? Because it's I think about, these are really valued questions. It's about one about the capacity. If we're going to have some major projects coming up and potentially major national infrastructure projects, the Gigabyte factory, mm. um, uh, so will we have the capacity to do that if we're taking all these things? Again, it might be the answer is that the two together will provide the capacity for it, but it's, it's just a question about that and the question, the time and the consultation, will the 300,000 be enough? And, and again, where will the HQ? Because if we're going to be planning for, for, again, this will obviously take time, and there will be logistics around planning uh, and purchasing or procuring a new HQ because it did take longer at Warwick District Council and didn't come to fruition, shall we say? I'm trying to be as delicate as possible there, David. I think you'll, I think you'll get my ideas. So yeah, that's sorry if I've rambled on. I just wanted to get one or two points over. So thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Crown. Can I just clarify then with regards, with regards to the gigabytes? You're saying when there's larger national projects going on within the area as well. And that's an extra work stream coming in to both councils. Will they have the capacity to cope with that whilst also looking at the merger? Is that the question? Looking at the merger, looking at potential new office location, making sure we consult properly. There's, there's going to be a lot of 
yeah. resources needed. Um, and you know, and again, it's, it's, it's I'm not saying we can't do it. And then again, the, the, the merger might be out of free resources to do that. So it's just just fine raising that question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cramp. Uh, Mr. Buckton, would you like to go first on that, or George, and then Councillor Jefferson? Okay, I'll go, I'll go first. We, we, we did discuss the issue of your question previously, uh, Councillor Cramp, about whether a full referendum would be envisaged as part of this proposal. What, what, what would be undertaken is meaningful consultation, and, 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 and I'm going to come back to the committee with what size sample that would mean for the South Berkshire. So at this point, we're not proposing a full referendum in relation to, to the proposals. Um, in relation to the Boyd District Council, yes, they did propose a £50 increase in their council tax to, as a climate change one off. As far as I'm concerned, that, that, that isn't progressing. Of course, that was a casualty of COVID because they couldn't hold the election that would have been required because of the um, but the referendum that would have been required for the £50 increase. So as, as far as I'm concerned, that, that, that has fallen. The work in relation to future HQ, I'm not going to tell you. I, I, I can't begin to speculate. Where, where that would fall. I, I do know though from personal experience when I worked at Wire Forest and we had Bewdley and Kidderminster, two big towns that both wanted to host um, Wire Forest. So I'm, I'm sure some kind of compromise would be um, devised in relation to that sticky issue about where future headquarters would be. Can I just quickly come in? Um, about the capacity as well. Capacity. The national you know, with all the projects and that—that's the only other thing as well. So. It, it would be a major ask for the two local authorities, but the alternative is that we have to slash and burn budget. So I think I think we would have to either create capacity out of three hundred thousand, or even on something like the project on on the relation to HQ, resource that properly in its own right, because there would be a capital receipt which would be generated from the sale of both Elizabeth House and and uh, Riverside House, so to to enable us to to invest in the new facility together. Can I just quickly come in because my um, internet froze slightly. Can you just confirm why we're not doing a referendum on the um, public consultation aspect of this? OK, um, what, what we're talking about is submission of proposal which has to have local support and that can be derived by way of a, a consultation which would be far less costly than a full referendum. I think Councillor Crump mentioned the several hundreds of thousands of pounds that mm. the referendum would have cost in relation to the, um, the, the climate change premium to pay six pounds a year that Warwick were considering. So yes, it's a cost matter from that perspective. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Buckland. Councillor Jefferson, was there anything you wanted to add? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> oh, David's absolutely right on the uh, scale of the cost of a referendum. It, the cost running to many hundreds of thousands just for one district. And I think uh, Councillor Crump has actually made a good point, uh, probably in reverse. But the reality actually is combining we will have greater scale and greater resource. Yes, we have to go through the issue of, of a merger, but if you start to look at it jointly together, we do have the scale and the expertise to do far more than we do separately. I'm just picking up finally the point on the HQ. Uh, there is no doubt about it that the role and nature of HQs will change really quite significantly. I mean, the reality is there will be more people working from home. Uh, both organisations will need, even independently, would need smaller HQs. We'll have to do work in terms of what kind of HQ we want and where it will be. And in an ideal world, it probably would not be in Warwick, Leamington or Stratford, but that's a decision for another day. Well, Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Plenty of room in Satham, Councillor Jefferson. Plenty of room in Satham. We need a passport for that, Councillor Crump. Um, OK, can I please bring um, Mr Parkson at this point, please, our Deputy Chief Executive. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman, um, and thank you for the opportunity just to make a few comments at this point which you, you asked me in the chat. It's been really interesting sort of listening to what's been said so, so far. And I think what we're looking for here at this stage, we mustn't lose sight of is an early steer about is this something that as a council we want to pursue? And we just, we're looking to pursue a lot of questions about detail, which are all really interesting and challenges for us that we'll have to address. But at the moment, before we invest a lot of time and energy in this, we want to know, is this something that we're looking for support going forward? That's what we're asking for at, at Council this week. Um, I'll, I'll go through the list if you don't mind. Um, 
we've, we've talked a lot about sort of referenda. I think we mustn't lose sight of the fact that you are the elected representatives of the people. And you're sort of, they voted for you to sort of to give some leadership here. It's really important that we get the public consultation involved. But I, whether a full referendum is necessary, I'd probably question because, as I say, you are the elected voice of the people. Um, one of the big things to me about this is that it's some. Um, it would be government based on a function of economic geography. There's a load of interlinking between our two economies and sort of the way people sort of live and work in Stratford and Warwick. And the point that Councillor Crump raised about the Gigafactory, we've had two big announcements this week. Um, Jaguar Land Rover's commitment to Gaiden as their sort of headquarters and the potential of the Gigafactory at Coventry Airfield. Now, those two things would both be within the South Warwickshire Super District. They're intrinsically linked. And surely we should be sort of working together to maximise the benefit of the UK economy that we can get out of these initiatives rather than sort of infighting between sort of two district councils about sort of who's in which area. Um, I've just got a sort of couple of points just to sort of conclude really what I wanted to say. I think in terms of, sort of the, the unitary debate, we, we can't get away from it. It's it's in the background. It's, it's not survive at the moment. But if we start giving some thought to this, start building a council based around a, a functional economic geography, we're, we're sort of setting the agenda and we're ensuring our residents get represented rather than perhaps responding to something that's going to come down to us when we haven't sort of got time to, to sort of respond as effectively as we might. And through that, we can sort of preserve as many services for the sort of residents as we can. So thank you for the opportunity to make those comments. I hope they've been helpful for you. Thank you for clarifying those points, uh, Mr. Perks. They are indeed very helpful. Um, I've got a question from Councillor Fielding. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm in, I'm very supportive of this concept that we've got before us, and I'm prepared to propose that we do it, allow it to go forward uh, as um, per the Cabinet papers. However, I would like to see, because there's so much detail has been raised by everybody, that we see a timeline where we can sort of get some indication of when all these different aspects will come forward. At the moment, we are talking about a proposal where we don't know a lot of information. The Cabinet has got the Deloitte's papers. Uh, they are very interesting to read. I succeeded in reading them believe it or not, without going to sleep. Um, and I really recommend that this goes forward to the council meeting. Councillor uh, Fielding, can Monday. I just interrupt you here very quickly? We are not making recommendations. Um, we are simply scrutinising, hence the extra meeting today. Um, but this is this is our opportunity <laughs> when we've got Councillor Jefferson and Mr Buckland with us for them to take on board our comments as a committee. So it's great to know your support for this, but did you have a question? Well, the question basically is what sort of timeline will be will be agreed so that we can see different aspects of the merger taking place. Thank you very much, Councillor Fielding. That's, a, that's actually a really important aspect of this. Um, I don't, does that tie in, Councillor Fragi, with your question about timelines? Uh, not not quite. I've not yet. Not yet. Okay. But, but we'll get I you in a second then. I do have Don't another question uh, with my... We, sorry, Councillor Fraser, I'm going to come back to you. I just want to see if there's a response to the um, timeline question from Mr Buckland and Councillor Jefferson. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair. I, I, I would just point out to pages 64 and 67 on the Cabinet agenda, because there, there, there were some indicative timelines included on, on that. They are the, the work of Deloitte, and we would have to review that and come out with our own timelines ourselves. But it, it does give an overview of the kind of high level issues that would need to be considered and, and the kind of steps that would need to be taken. Mm -hmm. such a so there, there is an indicative one on paper 64 and 67. Thank you, Mr. Buckland. Councillor Jefferson. Uh, I think um, one of the really good points that uh, Councillor Fielding makes is this is about the concept at the minute. There is an awful lot more work to do. I mean, the detail of questions we've had just demonstrates how much work needs to be done. And at the moment, we're concentrating on the vision and on the concept. And assuming it gets approval at council, that's when an awful lot of the detailed work will start that can actually answer the detailed questions that people have been asking. 
Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. I'm also really appreciative that you and both yourself rather and Mr Buckland have agreed to come in to update Obion scrutiny um, every couple of meetings, haven't you? So we know exactly where we're up to with all of this and have the opportunity to scrutinise in this way. Um, Councillor Fragley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, with my uh, town council hat on, uh, I wondered if we could have the uh, the view of, of uh, the leader and, and David Buckland as to what impact will this uh, forming of this council, new council have on uh, town and parish councils. Um, and, and in addition to that, the in, within the timetable that um, is, has been uh, published, we're talking about this new council being formed in May uh, 2024 which I presume will uh, start with some uh, elections uh, on new electoral boundaries. Um, so will that mean then that the, the elections scheduled, currently scheduled for 2023, will they go ahead or not go ahead? Because it seems silly to have elections two years running. It, it costs money. Um, but once again, with my town council hat on, um, the Stratford Town Council has elections also scheduled for 2023. Um, will they still go ahead on their existing town boundaries uh, and thereafter be stitched into the new boundaries? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fragley. A very interesting question there. So I don't know who wants to go first because obviously that's a big consideration. Councillor Jefferson? Yes. Um, the uh, 2024 uh, start date for the new council is our working assumption at the moment and given all the work that needs to be done and the local government boundary commission will actually need to be heavily involved because it would mean new ward boundaries it would mean a close look at the number of councillors for the new council so 2024 seems a reasonable start date for the new council uh, given the amount of work that needs to be done, that will probably mean that the elections in 2023 do not for the district do not go ahead. Uh, personally, I would see no reason why the town council elections in 2023 couldn't go ahead. Uh, but I'm not an expert and I'm not a member of the Local Government Boundaries Commission. Uh, as far as the impact on town councils and uh, parishes goes, I would have thought initially that they would carry on as before. We've already heard there are some differences between the way that parishes operate in Warwick District and the way they operate in Stratford District. Whether or not they are aligned, I think, would be a matter for the new council. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson. Does that answer your question, Councillor Fragley? Um, well, it, it does. If town council elections are held in 2023 on the existing boundaries, and a year later those boundaries change because of, of, of this uh, uh, proposal, um, we will have town councillors working in, in different, different wards from the, the district councils. Which doesn't sound right to me, but there you go. Chairman, I, I think as, as Councillor um, Jefferson explained, we're, we're talking about, as we've said many times this afternoon, this morning even, sorry, a merge in the two districts and, and the impact immediately on the Town and Parish Councils would be limited because they would continue to offer the services they currently undertake and the district councils would continue with that. I think there's, there's more than a fair chance that if Government approved the May 24 go live date, as, as Councillor Jefferson said, elections would be held over the district element of that. Now, when the Local Government Boundary Commission, if, if again, if the proposition gains traction, there would have to be a, a, a new Local Government Boundary Commission review for the, the wider South Warwickshire. That would undoubtedly pause the exercise that we have currently started, and therefore the new ward boundaries yeah. wouldn't ever come in, in, into, into place. But when they undertake that exercise, the, the, the Boundary Commission do look at existing town and parish councils in devising new ward boundaries. Mm. And therefore, the, the ward boundaries for, for Stratford Town would be considered import, uh, an important consideration as part of that, that new warding pattern, if you like. So yeah, I, I think they wouldn't ignore 
what 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 the, what the elected members would be for at the town and parish council level. Thank you, Mr. Buckland. Councillor Franchi, does that reassure you? Yes, thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you. Um, if I could just come on with a question um, I have myself. So the report proposes the creation of a steering group of members comprising the leader and deputy leader of both councils and four other councillors of both councils representing the other political groups with formal quarterly reporting of progress to each respective the cabinet slash executive. My questions are, will these meetings take place in public or will they be private meetings like the South Warwickshire Advisory Group? What opportunity will residents and other members have to contribute to this group? And will these reports also come to OSC and therefore be subject to proper public scrutiny? And more generally, if the proposals are agreed, how would you like us as a committee to support and contribute? So a number of little questions there. Chairman, we, we, we have our monitoring officer, Phil Bafton, on the, on, on the call. I wonder we what are it, lucky this morning with our resources, so for, shall we bring... Let's bring yeah. Phil in. OK. <laughs> Mr Grafton, welcome to the meeting. Hello, hello. I've been watching and listening intently. Thank you. Um, so, so the the principal um, idea behind the steering group of members is to allow um, a safe space for officers to bring proposals forward to them um, to to discuss. We had a sim. Members will remember that we had a similar setup. Um, when we were working with Chirwell and South, South North Ants Council um, and from those group meetings proposals emerged for business cases for the um, estab establishment of for example a legal service and an IT service. That's not to say that the uh, the remit of such a group could not change or that there might be um, opportunities for people to contribute to the discussion at those meetings or that the, the terms of reference for that um, um, group might not change and it has to be said that we like a lot of this um, that's been discussed this morning the detail around that group has not yet been established but that that was my understanding of how that group would operate Thank you. And what support and contribution would there be from OSC? Um, I think it would be um, a question to be raised when we're drawing up those terms of reference, to be, to be quite honest with you. OK. All right. Can I just flag up a concern I've got with your response, um, Mr Grafton? I understand it's all in the future and it's a bit of crystal ball gazing here, but I'm just a little bit concerned that there's no public and no opportunity for us for residents to contribute. Am I misreading what's being proposed? I, th I think if we're just talking about this particular group that's in that recommendation, that was very much around how I understand it was going to operate. But that's not to say there are not other ways in which the public and the OSC can get involved. Because obviously we are looking, hopefully, as an organisation and hopefully if we become a super district to pre-decision scrutiny, aren't we? So it's, I am keen to know what... Yeah the involvement would be yeah so so um your pre-decision scrutiny you're you're working together with the, the cabinet here and ditto at um warwick with their executive would continue as now um and and no doubt uh, the leader and the chief executive would be coming to those meetings to explain progress on on the on the development of the relationship and of course, all those meetings are are open to the public. So the, what I'm saying is that don't look at that issue in isolation, please, from the other avenues in which the OSC and the public can get involved and be fully informed about the progress of the developing relationship with Warwick. Thank you, uh, Mr. Grafton. That does clarify the point for me. Um, can I just check as well with regards to the meeting? So, for example, today's is available to the public if they're watching now, but it's not available on the website. Now, we've covered a lot of really interesting points and we've been very grateful for the resource of, of our um, top management team here. It's a shame that our residents won't have access to this if they weren't able to attend because they were at work. So why is it that OSC isn't on the website, especially for meetings that have high public interest, such as as anything to do with a potential merger? 
I think it's just the way that um, that things have developed over the last 12 months, to be honest with you. If you remember before the pandemic, um, the only um, the only meetings that were were broadcast were those of the um, council, cabinet and planning committees as they were. Um, then we went into lockdown and of course now all our business is virtually online. I would agree with you it's time that we reviewed that practice and whether we should expand uh, broadcasting of meetings to other committees uh, one of which probably the most important would be overview and scrutiny committee. OK, thank you, Mr Grafton. That's reassuring to hear because I think people are engaging far more now digitally with with um, yeah. committees, aren't they? Which is great to see. I think we have um, a question from Councillor Wally Hoggins. And then if anybody else has a question, please let me know in the chat. I think we're coming towards the end of our meeting. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to come back to something uh, that Mr Buckland um, alluded to earlier on. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big there's a big group of people here that are not residents, and that is the employees really. And we'll just focus on the Stratford District employees because I, I want to make sure that with all of this that 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 they have a voice because there's nothing worse than having something just done to you and having to to go along with it. So my question is around the the following. I know that um, currently Stratford District Council has a moratorium uh, on on recruitment, so there are vacant posts and we we don't advertise to to fill those posts. However, the not is that is not the case at Warwick. They're still actively recruiting um, for va for vacancies there. So already Stratford employees could view themselves as being the 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 the. the, the um, the, the poorer of the of the two. So my question is, what has this council done to consult employees um, on the proposed substantial changes to their working life, please? Uh, and what can we do to make it better? And what are we going to do to make their the transition for them um, easily it, um, more palatable, given the fact that there will be re there will be redundancies and job losses? I'm quite sure. Thank you. Chairman, if I can respond to that, the, the first issue in relation to the recruitment freeze. Yes, shortly after the onset of the pandemic, mm -hmm. as a management team, we, we agreed that we would freeze recruitment apart from the all but essential positions. And, and we have done a limited amount of recruitment in the mm -hmm. last year. We've had a, a CCTV operator who was required, if we did not recruit to that position, that we wouldn't have been able to continue with the 24 7 coverage. So we have had some recruitment but it has been much limited. It wasn't because of, I will say, any potential merger at that point. It was just to try and address the overall financial position that the council was probably facing. Because if you recall, quite early in the pandemic, we were estimating a, a shortfall of £8.6 million pounds in the year. We, we have been fortunate to receive £7 million pounds worth of government grants, and we did get more car parking revenue over the summer than we expected. So the shortfall on this year has reduced to £2.5 million. I've raised this issue though with, with Warwick because you're right, they don't have a freeze in place at the moment, but they have undertaken to uh, review that position if both authorities had um, positively supported the, 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 the vision as, as we move forward. In, in relation to staff, the, the leader and myself had a, a briefing for staff a couple of three weeks ago now where we had 250 staff attend two separate briefings where they received the headlines about what the proposals were and what was coming forward to Cabinet and Council. Um, Unison though are the, the recognised negotiating body that we have with, with the staff side and as I say we, we, we prepared Chris and I, Chris Elliott and that is, and, and myself arranged a joint meeting with Unison to discuss the proposals and we were presented with this statement that they, they had prepared, they'd already met, the two Unison branches had met previously in which they do support what is being undertaken here. So I think that that is an important consideration and I can share um, their joint statement with, with the committee if, if that would be helpful just to see. I mean, we, we, we prepared a whole spiel about why this was necessary, but they repeated within the statement before we even started the kind of pressures which are facing local government at the moment. And, and I will say within that there their position on national, well, on, on unitary authorities was was noted as well that they would want to avoid that across the piece. So I think the, the vacancies that we now have online, and it was reported just at the employment and appointments. I think we have 18 vacancies at the moment. 
would make for any integration of the teams to be far less painful than it would have been otherwise. But, but the point is, it, the point's taken that they haven't had such a freeze at, at Warwick. Their turnover rates though, are generally slightly higher than at Stratford in any case, and we would seek to avoid redundancies in implementing proposals. But we, we've said to both branches and, and it's recognised what one of the suite of documents that we have coming through is, is a joint redundancy policy. They, they may be inevitable, but the consequence of not doing it would be far more local redundancies than if we're working together. Can, can I just pick up, Chair? <coughs> um, <coughs> I, as David said, I attended the staff briefings and I thought it was unbelievably impressive that over 250 members of staff turned up to the two briefings. And I am more than happy and I made it very clear that I'm prepared to turn up to any staff briefing that's needed. Thank you, Councillor Jefferson, and that is reassuring because we are supported by an incredible team of officers at Stratford District Council. So um, I thank Councillor Wally Hoggins for raising that point. We have talked today, I've seen you, Councillor Fielding, we have talked today specifically about the residents, but we must also remember the amazing team of support we have within Stratford District Council. Councillor Fielding, you have a quick question, I understand. Yes, I was just supporting what the leader was saying, but my question is, can we have a map or plan showing the boundaries of the two districts. I think it'd be useful for future reference. I see no problem in doing that. That would be very useful, actually. Thank you. Um, are there any further questions, committee? No, thank you so much um, to Mr. Buckland, to Councillor Jefferson and to uh, George Hill and to Tony Perks and to Phil Grafton. And if I've missed anybody out, I apologise, but thank you for your time in coming in today. I think we as a committee have found this incredibly useful. You'll see we're trying to help with regards to the scrutiny of such a complex issue for um, both, you know, for Stratford District Council. I think Councillor June has flagged up a really important point that we do please ask to be kept informed of the communication strategy because public consultation is top of our priorities as we bring our residents with us on any change. And we understand that change does happen, especially when you're coming out of a challenging pandemic, which I think our uh, organisation has met head on as, as strongly as anybody could and we are fully aware as well that you are up against it with your workloads and that's why we do thank you for this extra meeting today and we look forward to our regular updates at overview and scrutiny from both yourself um Councillor Jefferson and Mr Buckland but um we thank you for your time this morning um Liz I don't believe we have any urgent business no chairman thank you well then I will call this meeting to a close and thank you all very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you, Bye. Chair. Bye. Bye. Bye.